I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. This edition of Parallax Views is brought to you by the $10 and above tier supporters of Parallax Views on Patreon. So, with that in mind, producers credit shoutouts to Gunner, Mark, Alexander, Catherine, Tilo, Emilia, Jeff, John, B. Lund, Brian, Elliot, Michael, Brace, Nick, Galen, Arlen, Bo, Chance, Chase, Dan, David, Gary, Ishtofer, James, Martin, Matthew Ho, Nobody, Thomas, and Dano. And now on to the show. Beverly Hills is known as a society of wealth and privilege, but Billy Whitney doesn't seem to be getting his share. He thinks everyone is out to get him, even his friends. You never were one of us. He thinks that he doesn't belong. And they don't even look like me. Why, why are you guys doing this to me, huh? He believes he's seeing things. Bad things beyond reality. Is it just his imagination? I'm not paranoid. All my fears are real. Or has Billy uncovered something terrible? Something unspeakable? Don't go home, Billy. What, you've been living with these people all your life and you didn't know anything about this? If you don't follow the rules, Billy, bad things happen. You know you'll make such a great contribution to society. Who are you? And now, Billy. It's showtime, Billy! Is fighting. For more than just his sanity, he's fighting for his life. The time is coming for Billy to take his place in society. It's all about fitting in. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. On this edition of the program, we have a rather fascinating guest, Zeph E. Daniel, a screenwriter known for his work on such horror films as Bride of Reanimator, Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, Initiation, and, perhaps most notably, Society, the sci-fi body horror cult classic that deals with themes of class warfare and the rich feeding off the poor, in the case of the movie, both metaphorically and literally. In the second hour of the program, we'll turn our attention to Zeph's return to screenwriting with the 2021 horror thriller Girl Next, which deals with demonic entities and a rather sinister MKUltra-style experiment. The conversation goes in a number of different directions, and Zeph and I do come from very different worlds. Namely, Zeph is a born-again Christian, and I wouldn't say that I belong to that sort of milieu. Uh, But it does lead to very interesting conversation, specifically when we talk about Zeph's thoughts and feelings with regards to how his creative works have often been rejected by the Christian community. We'll also talk about his belief in spiritual warfare, how the movie Society started out as a story about satanic cults before turning into a sci-fi horror tale. 
Zeph's next movie and the big horror movie star that will be appearing in it. His special thank you credit in the serial killer movie Ed Gein, starring Steve Rilsback, working with horror movie filmmaker Brian Yuzna. How Zeph became a screenwriter. His interview with Jacobin Magazine about society, sex in cinema, and much, much more. A word of warning, if you haven't seen Girl Next yet, there's going to be spoilers in the second hour of the show. With all that being said, let's get right to it with Zeph E. Daniel. Welcome to Parallax Reviews, a guest that I'm really interested to be speaking with, uh, Zeph E. Daniel of The Zeph Report, and also a screenwriter, director, and producer. Uh, some of the films he's been involved with as a writer or producer are Society, Bride of Reanimator with uh, Rick Fry, and Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, Initiation, as well as uh, some newer movies such as Girl Next and The Quantum Devil, and I should mention... Uh, also, a movie that uh, I still need to see uh, that you actually directed, uh, Zeph Dementia from 1999. So you've worked on a number of films. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And it's a beautiful day here in New Mexico. And uh, and it was snowing two days ago and it was freezing. And now it's warm. So I'm happy today. Yeah, I'm taking a break from uh, just finished the novelization of Girl Next. And that really warmed, you know, pretty intense, you know, being the, actually dealing with all that. And so now I'm kind of recovering. So it's it's good. It's a good day. So if you could, maybe you could tell my listeners, how, how did you get involved in writing movies? I think you were, uh, you went under the name Woody Keith back then, but how did yeah, that all okay. start and uh, working with Brian Yusna? Well, for me, it was just, uh, you know, kind of a fluke because I had uh, well, we've just done a little documentary of how I came to write Society, which I guess was my second um, script. And, um, you know, it's important to note that, you know, the society we started with is not the one we ended with. But there's a lot of stuff that did come from not I wouldn't say exactly autobiographical, but you'll see it in the documentary to come up. It's called uh, The Dark Side of Society. So that's, in you know, finished, but it needs to go through the legal department. So how I got started, I, I was having uh, troubles. I had all kinds of issues and troubles, which I discuss in that. I don't want to go into them here, but I was trying to, um, went through a divorce at the time, you know, I was maybe in my late twenties and I um, was having panic attacks and, you know, they're giving me all kinds of drugs and I was, things were not going well. And because I couldn't go out during the day, I was, you know, what they call agoraphobic where you just can't go outside and I couldn't get in a line. And if I had to turn left and there was like a long line turning left, I feel like I was going to die. So I, you know, but uh, I could drive at night. So I went and I saw in the LA weekly an ad for the Hollywood script writing Institute, which I know um, Brian made fun of in the documentary because it was just this little hole in the wall school. And uh, I signed up and I drove down there at night and, you know, there was a class full of people and a, a real guy, in, you know, instructor. And he was talking about Robert Town and Chinatown, all these great movies, why they work, why they don't. And then, you know, to get us started. And there I met uh, Rick Fry, who wound up being a partner in society. And and um, and uh, that was a very interesting uh, collaboration and how I ran back into him after, you know, being a schoolmate of his. And uh, I, I wrote a screenplay in class that um, got optioned by a guy in the USC uh, film program. Uh, it was a producer's program. I think it was like the Ray Stark, Ralph Stark, something like that uh, producer's program. And that gave me a lot of, that was like, wow, you know, I got the bug and here's something I can do, panic attack or not. And uh, so I started in and... Um, what was it that... The that made you say, you know, this is something I really want to do, the writing process. Was it just something I, you had a knack for? Yeah, because I'd been, you know, I'd written a lot of one-act plays in school, and I also was a poet to start with, write long, long things of poetry. I didn't publish them, but, you know, when I was in high school, I had a story I wrote that actually got the attention 
you know, we never made anything out of it, but, but it got the attention of Rod Serling, the uh, famous Rod Serling, who then, you know, told me he was interested and, and uh, he thought it was a terrific story. And I guess it was the, the English teacher that uh, knew him or whatever and got it to, to him, the story. And it was a, it was a uh, kind of a sci-fi story. It was about time, time and dimension. It's almost like the same thing. We deal with dimensions and time. I keep dealing with that. But it was about like a how, you know, and it's kind of a funny thing because the, the character had some cereal that was laced with some kind of a chemical that would alter space and time. And he was a surfer. And he, and, but the problem is, you know, he'd paddle out of Malibu and there'd be like a million people in the water. You know what I mean? It's just aggro, you know, people fighting and just did, if you've ever been there and seen that, you know, it's, it's pretty ugly. And so he, his wish was that he could have it to himself just one day, you know, and have a beautiful wave and no people and just, just so anyway, the cereal that he got uh, turned him to this dimension, you know, where it's like, it wasn't like fourth dimension. It wasn't, he wasn't like, a, it's, it's almost like 3.4 degrees. Like it was the third dimension plus about four degrees. And that got him mal that got him the surfing spot. And, uh, and there was nobody there. And he was the only one on the beach. And uh, I cannot explain, you know, let's call it a dream for now, because I can't explain how he got to the beach that day. But, you know, he was there and he went out surfing, had the perfect wave. And it was just like four o'clock in the afternoon and the wind died down. It was just a perfect wave over and over and over and over, over and over again. And then finally got out on the beach and it's like, shit, am I stuck here? You know, and, and he's, you know, and, 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 and he, you know, he wanted to go home and he, he was, he regretted his desire, uh, you know, to, to be there on the beach. Um, and, uh, well, a, a pretty girl is coming down the, of course, coming down the beach, you know, and then he sees her and she's the only one there. And, uh, and she sort of does the, the same thing as the Wizard of, Wizard of Oz, you know, <laughs> click your heels and you wind up back home. So he falls asleep on the beach, you know, with her. There's, they don't do anything together, but he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, it's crowded and people are screaming. And it's, it's the same thing he left. It was just all kind of a dream. And he was so happy to be there. And he was so happy for the fighting and the crowds. And he never made another complaint about it. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> that was the story. A short story, you know, it's like a 15, 20 minute thing on, on, film it would have been so then, so, go on well that's you know so drawing on that kind of natural ability i had with with words and 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 able to put words into stories and writing uh i drew back on that when i had i'd been um uh i, I i'd been a musician i'd been you know that always worked out for me but you know trying to uh fit myself into the society of you know, business and different things. You know what I mean? This sort of cookie cutter thing. I, it was, uh, you know, psychologically um, painful, I guess. And uh, so the writing was like an outlet, you know, to uh, the writing was a, um, was a way to, uh, well, I don't know. I just go somewhere else in the writing and I'm in a happy place there. And I can't tell you what happens because, you know, any writer will tell you once you're engaged, you're gone you're gone. You're not here anymore. And I guess that's what it is because I love to escape. I love to get, but Disneyland won't do it for me anymore. So. So I'm curious um, with regards to the movie society, I, I do know that it started out very differently than what it ended up being. And it's become a cult classic today, but I, I'm not sure that it was always going to be this movie that had uh, the sort of alien subplot. It started out as something very different. Uh, when you and Rick Fry uh, wrote it together, correct? Because you, I know you have a documentary coming out about it. But my my listeners were very interested to hear how it started out versus what it okay. became. Well, see, Rick came on the scene, you know, and I was writing, and it was really kind of strange because it was kind of, you know, having uh, been and sort of grown up in this, you know, satanic atmosphere. I'll just put it that way. Um, and also having been through mind control, 
I just I, I don't I can't go deep into this right now, but I just I I hate to drop like bombshells and then not back it up with stuff. But you know, having been through um, brainwashing and mind control, that there is no such thing as Satanism and people and uh, abuses and 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 on and on and and you know deaths and uh, there is no 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 underbelly of our society like that. It's just what you see, and so you know the idea was to get me back to that kind of state of mind. But what was happening? is um i you know i was it's funny it's like when i started writing it i remember i used to lock in the drawer i never lock, locked anything in the drawer i was really uh you know like i was g- gonna get in trouble or something for writing it you know and so that was really a weird thing and then um you know when i got it basically it's about a boy raised in beverly hills by his family to be, you know, sacrificed. He's being gaslit the whole time, like a like a sheep to the slaughter. Lamb so slaughter. in the original story, they're like a satanic cult almost. They're a satanic cult, and he's being led to, you know, led to this sacrifice. But I have to say something about tone. It was always a satire or a black comedy. You know, it always had that, like those characters were always, they always stayed pretty much the same as we, you know, as we kept uh, working on, you know, as we kept developing it with Brian. And uh, and I think, um, you know, he wanted the sarcasm and the satire. And, um, but he changed it to where the boy was adopted so that, and that the people, the cult in Beverly Hills, and, and they're all over the place, um, were, you know, genetically or, you know, different or breakaway genetic pool from the rest of us and not alien but they were just a breakaway you know that th- they could do this shunting thing um and uh that was part of their genetics it was part of uh i think as is brian had it was like some kind of virus or something in their system that allowed them it, you know so they um you know control the wealth of the world and they can and they can meld and shift and they turn into these you know, shunting, orgiastic shunting beings, <laughs> which and in the original, it was, um, I mean, I've heard people say it was a slasher that was, you know, a, a lousy slasher script that was turned into this masterpiece about, you, you know, um, I think um, it was always a critique on, you know, and a kind of a slam on, on, Satanist and the wealthy and the shallow attitudes and the I don't care and oh that's too bad he died and you know you know what I mean this kind of shallow creature that you find in these in these environments. So and in so, a way, but, there always was that. I, I know something that uh, a lot of people are taken in by with the movie is the sort of class element where it's you know it, they're basically yeah. elites, the villains, and you know there's the one normal kid that that is trying to fight back. Yeah, that was always well, sort of there. Yeah. And and so it was like he was adopted. And in, in the original version, he was uh a good kid. You know, I mean it wasn't like, you know, a fuck up or anything. He wasn't, you know, we you know, weird like I was very weird, very fucked up. And he he wasn't. And he's just as he discovers more about, you know, that he's being led into this sacrifice. The idea is, well, they always have sacrifices. See, they always have sacrifices. And he was just chosen to be one. He wasn't told. And so it got changed to where he was adopted. So they raised him all this time to sacrifice him in the shunting without telling him he was adopted and that he didn't have the physical characteristics or capabilities of the people that were in the cult doing this, this shunting orgy. Um, so that's kind of where that went. But uh the characters, you know, were the, the the same group of characters, and we Rick and I, when 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 I was, I wrote up to about page eighty three, eighty four, I think, in my first, and then I started having panic attacks again because it was coming up to the time where they're going to sacrifice the kid. So I I so I went. I decided, well, let me go get this transcribed up to here, and then I'll finish it. And um, I went to a secretarial service in in uh, in the valley, and. Uh, uh, you know, and I told the woman there what I wanted to do. And lo and behold, Rick was in there, Rick Fry. And he had his own little office back there. He, She said she gave him office space so he could write her screenplay. 
an idea that she had. And then I said, well, you know, Rick, how, how's it going? You know, since school and everything good, you know, and I said, well, you know, I've been writing this, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. So could you take a look at it? <laughs> and so he took a look at it and he said, I'm in, you know, he just went all in. And then he did a draft. There's like 250 pages. I was, he was so inspired. And then I took it and then I did, you know, 120, you know, I had to rewrite the whole thing to get to 120. And then he wrote it. We kind of went back and forth on various versions. And then he handed it to Brian when they hit a deal with Brian for another screenplay. And I think it was called Weird Museum. I think that's what it was. Kind of, into, into, but it fell through. So we handed Brian um, uh, society. And then it just seemed like almost instantly it got approved of by the producers and then the uh, the investors. And, you know, just suddenly it was a greenlit thing, you know. And uh, I was going to say, by this time, Brian had sort of made a name for himself as a producer with movies producer, like Reanimator yeah. and From Beyond. But this was his directorial debut. This yeah. is a directorial debut and he was really into it, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, he got uh, the, the, the Japanese uh, investors who were involved, wanted uh, Screaming Mad I, I actually don't know how Screaming Mad George got involved, but he's the guy that came up with the shunting and all the effects in the end. So he started, you know, he brought uh, his Dolly paintings, you know, into the meetings we had. And then so we started adapting it to that. And um, it was pretty cool. I, I do, you know, I mean, I, I do remember coming up with the term, the shunting. And because the reason I, I and I may, you know, maybe a fault to me, everyone wants to take credit for everything. So I, I don't want to do that, you know, because it was definitely a great collaboration. But um, it, it was a combination of the word shun, like how society shuns you, and then hunt, right? Shunt. That's because I remember that, you know, and uh, when we were sitting there, I started writing it into the screenplay. Anyway, we all had a, you know, like, a, you know, a hand in it. And I believe the script kept getting better and more interesting. And I like this. I really like the satire. Um, and I like the characters a lot. There's a few things that are, you know, I would say when you see the documentary, what I, which I say are just directly out of my own you know, experience, you know, a couple of scenes that are almost like identical to something I went through. Um, but it is, a de you know, it's, it, it, it went from wherever Rick and I left it off and then it just developed further all the way to, to, to that. And then, then on that one, like I say, you had Brian, the producers, Rick, and Rick did a lot of drafts, me, and then you had Screaming Mad George and his influence and then, and then trying to work out what the budget should be on that. It sounds like it was really a collaborative effort, ultimately. I yeah, well, you know, it it was, and I even I remember we were working right up to the end, um, over at my house. And Brian was there, and uh, you know, got a weird phone call that day, and we were maybe about this is getting into the fall, so it's almost time to shoot. And Brian is the kind of guy he's going to keep. Well, you know, no offense, but. Brian, but he's going to keep writing, you know, he doesn't write during the, during the actual shooting. He's not like, you know, one of those kind of directors, but he's going to keep going all the way to the end, looking at every permutation and just obsessing on everything. He's not going to be happy until he exhausts every free minute in, you know, scrutinizing and then re-scrutinizing and then re-scrutinizing. And I understand that about him. So there's no problem. But I did get this phone call during one of our sessions, and this is toward the end. And Rick, I think Rick was Rick was in the hospital at that time. He had stomach issues. And this woman calls up and 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 she she's just saying that uh uh you know that that you know that that she tells me well that script is all true. And I don't want to go into anything more about who it was or anything like that, but I did go through a kind of a setback when I got that call. And then Brian got kind of concerned. So I had to snap myself back into normal mode and um, act like I didn't get the call and just keep going. And then I remember, you know, finally that first day of shooting, we shot at um, uh, Paradise Cove in uh, Malibu. 
And it was raining for about three or four days leading up to that. And then it just cleared up on that first day of shooting. It was just like, oh, we're getting a great break here. You know, look at that beautiful, uh, you know, it was a beautiful day in LA, just classic. Drove down to Paradise Cove. I was, I, you know, became an extra of the film. <laughs> and um, I drove down there and I saw Brian sitting in this tall director's chair. And there was the, the Devin DeVasca, some of the other actors around milling about. And he turns around and looks at me and goes, hey, we're making our movie. It was like a, like a, you know, a child. He was so excited to be, have that first directorial debut. And that, what he directed that day was uh, the guys under the pier. I remember the, the beach scene, Ferguson, the beach, that whole thing about, you know, uh, the girlfriend and wanting to go to Ferguson's party. And then, you know, and he had, and then Ferguson's humiliation of Billy and, and, and then, uh, you know, it's kind of the setup of the whole thing. So all that got filmed that day. And, um, you know, and then I think it's just been a blessed project. I know that Brian thought, you know, that it was going to go bing, 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 you know, that it was just going to be wildly accepted. And uh, what happened is it, it, it sort of got, got banned in the U S you know, uh, I, I would say, you know, it ended up doing well in Europe, I think. Well, see, the producers were are Brit British. And so the one producer, uh, Keith, Keith Wally, he uh, he wanted to go, you know, screen it in London, in the West End of London, in a certain theater. I, I didn't go to that screening. But the minute he, he you know, he forewalled it, I think. Actually, I'm not sure who paid for it. But anyway, it became a big hit. It, the people couldn't get enough of it and they're lining up outside and they just, they were, you know, they, it was just like a big giant uh, thing. So then it did get just distribution in the U S it took a couple of years to get here, you know? So like in 1990, it was in London and then it took like till 92 or something three before it got back here. In fact, we had it on laser disc, I think before there was a theatrical, you know, really? so, yeah, so that was interesting. And um, but yeah, no, I understand that the, the kind of people that read me that like you know my ideas and stuff, I we deal mainly with Europe, you know, we're kind of a European uh you know, our post-production goes on in Europe, you know, the people that we deal with, we it, you know, it's weird how we just I, I kind of fit more in England than I would here, you know. That um I think what made people nervous, and this is my guess is, um, you know, just the blatant, and there's a lot of stuff in the movie. I mean, I got to hand it to Brian. He just would not flinch. I mean, everything is in there. I mean, you've got this incest thing and you've got these uh, scenes that are very uncomfortable, you know, and very, um, and they're still uncomfortable today. And uh, they're in there, you know. Yeah, yeah, like the scenes with his family, with the implied incest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. The, the other thing of when you know they they're they're gaslighting him regarding the uh, the tape he has you know Bill's hanging on the table and, and he's saying you know then then he plays the you know that he uh, he goes to Ferguson's party and he goes and then Ferguson goes well you know the schedule first I fucked your sister and then everyone else got so turned on they fucked her too and and then I ran that bagel breath Blanchard right into a pole that's a pretty busy week he says. Uh, something like that to 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 Bill Ferguson. Is that the kid that that he's um he's, the he's in competition with or what's that? Yeah, he's the guy that's trying to rig the election and he's right, right. He's the guy the in student the student election. Yeah, the Cabana guy. He's got his henchmen. It's like his gang, and one guy is armed. Actually, I, I don't think you see the gun. I you don't, you know I, the reason I know is because we Brian and I just recently uh, wrote a novelization of society. And we wrote it together just recently. So I had to study the film like frame by frame. And I said, shoot, that guy has a gun. I didn't realize that. He's got a gun right here, you know, right? Right, you know. And um, I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, it may be the 80s, but it's still a disturbing movie. Plus it was shot really well. And I think, you know, the, the sound and music and all the technical aspects are, are very, very well done. Anyway, so I kind of had a thrill with that, you know, and, and you know, seeing that get done, and um, um, you know, it was like uh, I, I eventually 
did a couple of films. Eventually, I, I left the film industry, though, after a while. Well, it, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question, uh, two quick questions about society, yeah, if I could. Um, you know, I've always wondered. So, you know, I, I was always impressed in that movie with um, Devin DeVasquez as uh, Clarissa. And I was wondering, was there a version of that character when you initially wrote it, or is that something that comes in when Brian starts maybe rewriting aspects of it? No, he, no, there was a Clarissa, Clarissa in real life. Her okay, name, so a character that wanted to turn on the cult, basically, yeah. Well, I think that came from the rewrites, but I mean, okay. uh, no, uh, in the first version, I think um, at the end of the day, let's say you could follow those characters after they, you know, you, you know, punches his father out and, you know, and they, they kind of defeats the shunters and then they're driving in the Jeep and Clarissa joins them. It's more like in the original, um, the original take on it, uh, Bill is not sure where he's going to go. He escapes the the sacrifice of himself. Clarissa's mother winds up being a uh, a cannibal sacrifice at the country club. She winds up being like a stuffed pig, uh, where everyone's taking a slice out of her. Sort of like, uh, you know, you know, she's like on a table and she's got like a an apple in her mouth and you know you can you know because they're cannibals you know in in this early version and that didn't seem to daunt uh clarissa at all but rather when she sees bill in the jeep you know bill i think bill is going to go to milo's place or hide out in the beach somewhere or something they, they have to go somewhere and clarissa pulls up and she's got a little sports car or whatever you know next to him on sunset and she goes Oh, hey, Billy, you know, and after all this happens, you know, she's like, she's being sarcastic with him. And she's saying, you know, well, say hi to your parents for me. You know, bye. <laughs> you know, Just like nothing happened. Like life goes on the next day. It's like everything goes on. And uh, and Bill's trying to run for his life. But it's like, you, you don't get it. It just goes back to the same thing. It, it just continues on. And so that was pretty funny. But um in this one, she goes with him. And I actually speculated with Brian recently um, about like where we thought they went. And we had quite a disagreement on how Bill would wind up, how he would make a go of it after that, you know? And um, so we didn't write anything because I had one idea. And Where did uh, you think that would end up? Well, I think he would, you know, he would be uh, probably trying to expose this situation of this genetic, he'd probably be a, investigator and try to find out um if there's any of these other people where do they live what happened you know he'd probably want to do some kind of investigation on who these people are and how they can do this weird shunting thing and find out where in society is it where did it start how did it where do these people live do they control all the money in the world you know so um we kicked that around and Nothing really became of that because I think, um, you know, if we say that, uh, I think, I think the, the story is really what it is, is, you know, an allegory and a metaphor about, you know, what our society is much like, you know, the Truman show or something. And, um, you know, it's, 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 if you say any more then it kind of wrecks the illusion, you know, if you, if it becomes too normal, I mean, the whole idea was he was, uh, he he was a you know a good kid class president but he wasn't on Ferguson's level, he wasn't right. in society. Right, he he wasn't one of them. You know, there's I forget I think yeah. it's Ferguson that says to him at one point, you know, yeah. we, we always suck off shit like you, uh, you, you know the uh, poor. Yeah, yeah, we always suck off shit like you, and and uh, and you know laying down the law of the way it really is, and um, you know that the rich are somehow different; they're just genetically different than the rest of us. And um, that's why they had to adopt Billy. So I think that was a real uh, breakthrough in the story because that made it so people could really understand this was, you know, Billy represents, you know, humans, the population, us, whatever, and they are them. And, you know, and, 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 and if he was just raised to be sacrificed, you see, it wouldn't be as easy to understand right. as, it, as it turned out being. So that, so, you know, it it was a you know what I'd say collaborate with George bringing his brilliant Dolly stuff and Brian working on that trying to make the the whole 
thing work with the adoption and the, you know, working out, you know, the difference between these two people, these two species, really. And then, you know, and then keeping the sarcasm. See, it's very important to get that sarcasm. I'm glad we did that. So the sarcasm was there even in your original script, right? It, it's well, you know, there I I don't yeah. I don't know if I mean I I write the way I write and those the characters are kind of you know at least a few of them based on, you know, people I had known and stuff and so yeah, there's going to be if I ever write about them there would be sarcasm, but there maybe we put more in. You know, it evolved. It, 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 there must have been I don't know. 10 drafts, you know, rewrites done before from the beginning to the end. So it changed, you know, it changed a lot. I disagree with the idea that it was just a, some people like on wiki, they say it was a slasher script that was like, you know, Brian turned it into, you know, into gold or, you know, everybody trying to take credit. I, I, I can't attest to that. I, I think it was um, good enough and intriguing enough of a story to get him going on it. Yeah, I, I was gonna say real quick, even with your later collaborations, like um, you know, Silent Night, Deadly Night Four. I guess some people would say that's uh, oh, that's like a traditional slasher, but it really isn't. There's a lot going on in that. Now that, film. that was so much fun. Now that was fun. I mean, you know, that was Brian was obsessed with the Lilith, uh, uh, you know, tale, and uh, he had these books, and we were going through, we were going through the books, and he, he had art in the books, and he was he was really inspired. Um, with that and uh and actually the producer richard gladstein i think got brian going with that lilith idea and then i was there you know collabing with him i mean it was really a, a joint effort on the screenplay because he had all these ideas and then and then i'm i'm there you know the writer you know trying to keep up and uh because with you know sometimes you write the, a script you get really deep into it and then you go oh wait a second maybe it should have been this and, you know, it's painful to have to undo it all. Uh, with Silent Night, Deadly Night, we had to, a production date. It was, it, I, I forget the, the company. It was a com big company at the time. Did it start out as a Silent Night, Deadly Night movie, or was it originally going to be its own thing? It was Silent Night, Deadly Night, but and, and, and I'm not going to take the blame for it uh, completely or the credit for it deviating so much from the concept of Christmas. And, you know, when you, they're coming out with a new version. You, you're not the guy that told me it's Michael Flesher or Felsher. This, uh, this guy uh, producer um, called me and they're coming out with a, uh, just now actually uh, Lionsgate's coming out with a, a um, all five of the silent night, deadly, night, deadly nights on uh, Blu-ray. So that's coming out right now as we speak. And, you know, it's like four is the, is the, is sort of the, is, you know, the, the, um, in a way is kind of the naughty child or the black sheep, you know, now Brian also did five and I wasn't there on five. So I don't know if I got, I might've gotten fired and not known it. <laughs> I wasn't there, but um, five was, was a lot of people like five a lot. See, I, I like four a lot because I mean it has a great cast, you know, Clint Howard, Maude Adams yeah, from the, Maude the James Adams. Bond movies, and there's the whole witchcraft element to it. That's that's what I like. Well, of course, I'm coming from from knowing, you know, from dealing with Satanism, witchcraft, all these things. And Brian was really into this Lilith thing, and that just evokes the idea of paganism, witchcraft, and you know, and, and he had this artwork. And uh, it was all about initiation, you know, about they, they, they had to find the, their queen. And eventually it turned to like Egyptian religion. And that's weird. You know, I don't know why that happened um, because it was a, a different kind of religion at first. But anyway, the idea was they need to find their queen. They need to, they need to, and now they found the person and they need to initiate her, whether she likes it or not. And he had a great actress there too. And uh, Neith Hunter who um, I think did a great job. I, you know, and also Reggie Bannister was in it. If, uh, you From know, the if Phantasm I, movies. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. And I remember we shot it in this big warehouse and had all the, uh, you know, had the sets built in there and it was a, a quick shoot. It was a lot of high pressure, um, you know, to get it done. But when but, you say a quick shoot, like how long? Was it I, you I know, done in a couple of well, weeks? Maybe, or? You know, well, it was more than a, maybe five weeks it would be a quick shoot. And uh, maybe it was six weeks. Um, 
You know, to tell you the truth, I mean, five weeks is a lot of time. Six weeks. I'm not sure it was a five day. If it was a six day a week shoot, I think it was a six day, but it was SAG also. So I'm, I, you know, so it was kind of union, but I just, my mind, you know, I can't really remember exactly, but it seemed that it wasn't that long of a shoot. And then the editing process, um, I, yeah, it seemed like Silent Night, Deadly Night 4 just kind of got, got out there quickly compared to the other, because Ride and Reanimator took a lot of time, that took a lot of time to shoot, and then it took a lot of time to edit. And right. Society took a long time to edit, too. Because you're dealing with comedy and, you know, timing, and, you know, so it took a long time to get all those beats right. Um, and anyway, so... Yeah. Well, how, how did how did Bride of Reanimator come about out of curiosity? Um, because it comes out, you know, a, a few years after the original. And it, it yeah. felt like one of those movies that wasn't necessarily going to have a sequel right away. How, how did that all come together? They were going to do it. Uh, I think that, that, that the producers, I believe, and this is, you know, and you'll, you may have to get someone to correct me if I'm wrong, wanted to do the sequel to Reanimator, The Bride. And Brian, I think, wanted to direct it. And then there was some kind of problem. I think Stuart Gordon was originally going to direct it. And uh, I think Dennis Paoli was one of the writers. And I'm not sure what happened, but I remember having dinner with Brian. And, and, you know, he said, would you like to, you know, you and Rick like to take a stab at this? And and I was like, wow, I was totally shocked that uh, it was going to be a Brian uh, follow-up. And... um, I guess what happened is the producers got into a, well, he knows better than I do what happened. So something happened to where Stuart was out. And so the, the original reanimator team was out and Brian was in. So that was going to be his sequel. And, um, you know, that was a, that was a, uh, there's just a ton of effects in there, but I do remember, I remember the first draft that I wrote for it. We read one page and, you know, we were in, we have to keep meeting at Brian's house. And we, you know, we had one, like a couple of pages and then he set it down and go, okay, let's start writing. And then we, you know, you know, I was like, wait, wait a second, what happened to that draft? And we started over. So, I mean, we kept doing that, but then at the same time, we kept making progress with some of the breakthroughs. And one of my favorite things is the, uh, the head with the bat wings. I, I, I have to say that just delights me to know. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it, it's kind of a comedy. Um, my, uh, uh, I had a, you know, I had a at that time an Italian wife, and so I, and, and so it's not not uh, it's interesting how we wind up with this Italian girl in there named Francesca. It's very, um, I would say, very, uh, you know, you go back and you see things, and because yeah, I go, why would she be a, you know, uh, why would she be an Italian, and why would she, be, you know, what I mean? Because because that's what I was, that's what I was. You write what you know, you know. We all write what we know. And we had uh, same team, and uh, but it seemed like it was a bigger budget, you know, double the budget, and there was a lot of um, there's a lot of pressure on that one because it's a sequel, and and you know you you you, you, you Reanimator is famous, you know it's a cult fame, and you don't want to disappoint the, the 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 viewers. So I think what happened. Just my own perspective uh, is uh, that this one became not a sequel, direct sequel, but it became you know something else for the for the fans to look at that's maybe a little bit alternate to the first one. So not to compete with the first one, but it, in some ways to take it further and more wild and you know reanimator like you never saw it before type of thing, a little less conservative. And um, I think the public did accept it. So I, we're lucky we dodged a bullet there. I always because- compare Bride of Reanimator to, um, you know, you have like a movie like the original Gremlins, right? Then you have the completely bonkers sequel Gremlins 2. Um, Bride of Reanimator is sort of like that for me. It goes completely wild, you know, with the Kathleen Kinmont character, the bride, and, you know, David Gill's character returning, but he's headless. Yeah. And it's wild. Yes, it's wild. It's wild. It's messed up. <laughs> and, and that's what I think happened to Silent Night Deadly. I think, what, yeah, that uh, collab with me and Brian, it's, there's like a, like I was telling this one, we did an interview for the, uh, for the, the Blu-rays coming out. 
And I said, well, I think what it is, is it's got that fucked up factor. When you have that in a horror film, can't explain it or in any film, there's just something magical that happens, you know, and I can't, and I, if I try to do it, if you try to make it messed up and try to make it quirky and try to make it interesting, try to put a spin on and do something, it's going to fail. But if it's just, there's just natural, um, you know, maybe it's chemistry between us, you know, the collaborators, you know, and there's like this messed up thing that happens. The IE not, you know, doing Silent Night, Deadly Night, not, not having to have anything to do with Christmas <laughs> after initiating a, you know, some pagan queen, you know, for a cult in Los Angeles or whatever. Uh, yeah. See, that's the kind, you know, that's, I mean, I don't know. I'm a fan of that sort of thing, but I, I can't tell you how to, how to get it or reproduce it. If you try to do something messed up, it's going to come up to normal. So I don't know, but I do like it when that happens, when that happens. And I, and I just watch it again. I go, can you believe that? There's no Christmas in this thing. <laughs> I, was, anyway. I was going to ask too, with, with regards to society, um, what would you say is the biggest difference between what you originally had in mind and um, how it came out? Because I know you said that you don't like how people uh, think that it was just going to be a traditional slasher. So what would have the what would the biggest difference have been? Well, I think I think that, you know, I mean, I'm going back in memory and we had, you know, like a whole bunch of drafts before. But I don't you know, Rick gave him a draft. It would have been one out of, you know, 15 different drafts. But it was always kind of a it always had that comedic element of, you know, making fun of the rich, the, the shallowness of them as they guess, like always had that. And it was always about a, a, you know, a kid who finds out that his family's in a cult and he's being led by the nose to his own sacrifice. That was always the story from the beginning and all the way to the end. And um, so it wasn't, you know, a slasher because the, you know, the, the black comedy doesn't really go into a slasher. So, you know, but well, like I said, the, the, the changes that it went through and a lot of the dialogue got rewritten and, um, you know, better dialogue was brought in. But it, Brian wanted to push the comedic, you know, the satirical element, clearly. And that was a wise decision on his part. And I think because Rick had, a, you know, dialogue uh, uh, chops, I had character chops. And so we got to keep pushing those characters, you know, and then I really loved, uh, I really loved them all. And they're very, they're very unique. And, um, you know, I'm glad we kept, I think really what happened is it went into development and there were a few scenes that were, you know, out of the original, you know, that were what I, you know, where I started writing and they survived. Uh, but yet it was rewritten several times. I mean, we just, we all kept working on it, you know? And uh, like I said, it was me, Brian, Rick, um, and um, Rick, Rick did a bunch of drafts with Brian. I did drafts with Brian. I can't even tell you how many we did, but we did quite a few of them. And, um, but I, you know, I don't want to say that, uh, that the original was as, as, it, it, as satirical as the the one where we wound up, because where we wound up was a, uh, you know, it, 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 well, to me, where we wound up was perfect. Right. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy with the collab. I'm really happy where it wound up. I'm really happy with Brian's, uh, you know, oversight in, 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 in making these people genetically different and bringing in Screaming Man George and agreeing to go with like a Dolly type of thing. All these decisions that were made were, you know, is what really made it, you know. And Brian deserves, a, you know, the credit for the, for for the whole vision because, of, you know, he. But you know what he liked about, um, you know, about the character and stuff. He kept. We didn't lose that. So, and I know Clarissa. You asked me about Clarissa. Well, she was actually a little bit more developed in the screenplay than what what we ended up with uh, Devin. But Devin looked, you know, perfect. I think. And, and and she was fine. She was not exactly what I had in mind, but then she brought something, you know, she brought something to it. I'll tell you what she brought to it that I think really helped is she kind of, when she bonded with the character with Billy and she was kind of changing her mind. Now there was a, as I as we did the novelization and I had the shooting script and I had the, uh, you know, the, the society on the screen 
And in the script, there was a there was a point where she was mocking Billy. And it, it you know, before she was with him, she was mocking him and she was all with his going home where he'd have to face all that. And then she wasn't a couple of scenes later. So that got cut because that was not completely consistent. You know, there's a point where she changed. And I think that point is when the two of them spent the night in the Jeep in the parking lot and they bonded and then she had mixed feelings, but she's, you know, they can't be together, you know, because she's, uh, she's society. She's one of them and he's not. And so yeah, I think that comes up uh, near the end of the movie where I think she confesses her, her love, uh, her love for him or whatever. And he's just creeped out because he knows that she's an alien, you know? Yeah. I, I would love to, well, you know, I think maybe best we cut it off right there, you know, at the end of that scene in the, in the, the, the big party. I mean, you know, my feeling is that after that big party, after, you know, you defeat all the Satanists or the elite like that, they should probably give him, you know, some running room, you know, just because he pulled off that defeat, that's nobody does that. So they should back off and let him try to, you know, find his own life. That's what I was telling Brian. I just said, well, you know, maybe after a defeat like that, they, they get punished because it's supposed to be a big double header in Beverly Hills. We had two, two, two sacks, not just one, but two. And then that, that, you know, one got done, but the other one blown. And, um, you know, so I think the, the, the guy that uh, won Billy deserves, uh, you know, a get out of jail card, you know, he deserves to go off and, 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 you know, try to have a decent life somewhere. <laughs> And uh, so that's funny thinking about that. But uh, uh, I was going to say, out of curiosity, um, the, the movie is well remembered by various different types of people now. Um, mm -hmm. Some people that may not even look at the whole uh, satanic element. I mean, I've met people that could relate to it just from like um, the level mm -hmm. of I, I know people that are in unions that are like, yeah, this is what it's like being held down by my boss. Yeah. Um, yeah are you, are you happy with how it's remembered? It's it's sort yeah. of accepted by different people from all over the spectrum. No, I think it's, a, it's about class warfare. And it's about, you know, the, the, the elite, you know, stomping on the heads of, you know, most people and keeping them down, promising them like, you know, crooked politicians, promising your life will be better. It never is. Uh, you see the boss of the corporation, he makes, uh, you know, $200 million and the, the guys working there can barely afford to, oh, here's a better one. The people that, uh, work in hotels, in resorts, can't, you know, uh, when it comes to time to them to go out and do something, they can't afford it. So it addresses that very hot button issue. And yeah, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I, so yeah, you're I happy it. with how it's remembered now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, if I, I don't think I was unhappy. I was, I was never really unhappy with it, I don't think. But, you know, I had, uh, let's just say my opinion sort of, uh, at, fir at first, I was so excited. I was playing at parties and laser discs. I had a laser disc of it, so I was always playing it for people. And it was this, this big eat the rich theme. And I thought, cool, you know? And and that's, um, well, that's what it was always going to be. So, you know, I'm and I'm thrilled that Brian really brought that out. He really, he really nailed that one because he wanted that to be, you know, that was his uh, vision. And um, so, yeah, I'm 100% with that. And, uh, you know, that the way I look at directors and working with directors, it's, you know, I do this with Larry, you know, with our, our new movies and stuff. It's the director's vision. You know what I mean? And what you have to do as a writer is you have to, you know, like, and I, and I do this pretty easily. You have to forget about, you know, because what draft are you going to hang on? We had all kinds of drafts. What you don't want to do is start going back and saying, yeah, but it was better over here. I wish I had done that or, you know, he should have done this or he should have done that. And that's always a big mistake because it's an evolution. It's a collaboration. And so where you want to wind up is, um, and we also focus group, but we also played, I think we, we, we ran the film for UCLA film school or somebody and, you know, they filled out cards and stuff. And so we did, you know, try to see what was really working with an audience so in the end, I was, you know, really uh, pretty excited about, I, I had envisioned it originally, if there was any 
you know, if there was any like reservation with me is I just thought we, we, if we had more money, you know, that, that was about the only thing if it was, if it was done for a higher, but if a higher budget, they'd never let you do it. They would never let us do it. And then I, I came to realize that because those are the people you're talking about. Those are right. the rich. They would never let you do it. Well, yeah, you're mocking your shallowness amongst other things. Of course, yeah, they're, yeah. they're going to dislike the film. Yeah. But I think Brian would agree with this one. I do write those kind of characters, those kind of people, um, high society people, all that kind of shit. I do that. I do that's a natural thing. One of my natural loves is to write people like that. But I do, I wound up at odds with this. I wanted to, back when I was writing that, I wanted to burn down Beverly Hills. I, I, I was almost like a terrorist in my mind. I went, <laughs> I was, uh, I was at total odds with the whole system. I was, you know, not only Beverly Hills, but I mean, every institution there is, that's it, you know, blow it up, fuck it, I hate it. And so that was the, when I was writing, that was my mindset. Did Brian come from a different place then? Because he was no, more... Brian was very, he was, I, I don't know if he was a socialist or he was a liberal guy. I'm not sure what his politics really were. I, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, with me, it was, uh, it was, um, I think the reason I started even writing the thing in the first place was, was trying to find some healing because I felt that these people had gaslit me and they tortured me, you know, so I was wanting to get even with them. So I think Brian harnessed that, <laughs> that, 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 that anger I had toward the, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, you know, this, I, you know, I had a deep conflict because on the other hand, you know, I like you know, nice things and I had a nice car and I, you know, had opportunities that, you know, probably the average guy wouldn't have. And yet at the same time, I wanted to blow it all up. I wanted, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say that word blow up because I don't want to get people following me around right now. But, you know, I, I probably, um, you know, back then at that time, I felt very uh, alienated uh, to them. And I felt that I had been uh, rejected by society. And I felt that I had a lot of uh, opportunities that were taken from me and stolen from me. <clears throat> and I feel like uh, this was kind of a, you know, I hate to say a vengeance, but like I said, I used to lock it in the drawer. So I, you know, there was something going on there. You know, I, I was willing to forget the whole thing, but then I just, it just started seeping in. You have to write. I started writing it. Yeah, I was writing it with typewriter, and uh, you know, it, and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, and then it led to Brian, and then he did. But yes, I'm thrilled the way I wound up. I'm. Um, it made the. It had the. You know. You know. Now, it's actually better than than you know because at first it was it was good, but it was misunderstood here. Later, I, I'm not sure it was kind of a mix in the United States, but elsewhere it was really liked. And then eventually it really popped. All of a sudden, people really started liking it. And, um, you know, now where I am with it, I think it's perfect. I mean, Devin, you know, her, all the different parts, everybody cast was perfect. I, um, yeah, that's where I wound up on it. I, you know, and why is because there were no punches pulled. Everything in there um, was, you know, intentional and it was a little bit over the line and uh, the producers were uh, courageous enough to to put up with that lack of money that they could have gotten, you know, and, and Ryan told me, he said, you know, recently, he said, I, I feel like this film was going to be like a multi-million dollar hit. I thought this was going to be it. And he had no idea it was going to just go, you know, get banned. It wasn't really banned, soft banned. You know, soft banned is like the distributors just kind of like look the other way, hope it goes away. You know what I mean? But eventually they'll distribute it. And, and, and then you miss your opportunity for a theatrical release. You miss your opportunity for, you know, all kinds of, you know, you know promotion. And uh, so it, it was, you know, um, but now that I look at our society, I, I, I'm not uh, surprised. We did an interview with Jacobin, the Jacobin Society Magazine, whatever that yeah, is. Yeah, I, I know Jacobin. I was actually going to ask about this because I know you don't necessarily, you don't come from a socialist perspective, but I know a lot of socialists that like this movie, Society. Uh, there's a whole oh. horror movie podcast called Horror Vanguard. Uh, that they do like socialist um, critiques of horror movies and they love Society. I know you don't come from that perspective, uh, but how do you feel about socialists liking this movie or, or people like Jacobin? 
Well, we got along great with Jacobin. Uh, I know the history of the Jacobins, going back to the French Revolution. And um, so I found that was interesting. In fact, that was probably the best interview that I'd ever done and found that guy to be the nicest guy I've ever, pretty much ever talked to. He was just a really great interviewer. And um, then I, I gave him Brian's uh, email. And so then Brian, he contacted Brian and Brian jumped in. But yeah, no, they're, they're so, you know, it's funny. I'm in my life. I've been all kinds of things. And I think, um, yeah, I wound up being, uh, you know, having conservative views financially, like being a capitalist, wanting to actually, you know, make money. And then I, I, I guess I was, you know, I've gone through so many evolutions on it that I, you know, I'm just trying to remember back when I was, I guess when I, in those days, I was, they were concerned I was going to become like Patty Hearst or something. <laughs> and, you know, so there was a militant side of me that, that, that even scared Brian, I think. That, that where I was just really, and, you know, I, I was ready to, I was ready to lead the revolution, I guess, I suppose. I was ready to, you know, tear it up. And so instead of tearing it up and going to jail, I um, hit the uh, keys instead. And then Brian was sympathetic because he's, you know, he's, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to speak for him. Maybe you can interview him. And, uh, but he's, uh, I would, I would say that, you know, he says he's a, he's a classical liberal, which today would mean fairly conservative, you know, and, um, if he had made a lot of money on society, would he still be a uh, liberal? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's a mixed bag. Cause you see, to make movies, you need money. You need, I, they, they burn, you have no idea. It, it burned, the, it, it just, but whatever you think the budget is, it's gonna double, it, 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 you know, you're gonna have to get extra money somewhere. It's just gonna be a money struggle. It's, and, it's a money uh, struggle and oftentimes, um, you know, who's giving you the money, they can end up trying to compromise your vision in some ways. They can, and you know, that that's another issue. We're going through that, uh, not yet now, but we're, an actor comes on who's famous and then he has an idea about the script. And then uh, the, the company that you, you know, the uh, dis distributor or sales company that gives you the money to produce it, they have some ideas. And, you know, if you really hang on to everything, look, it's a collaborative medium. But, you know, don't, don't it's very seldom that somebody gets the green light to go do whatever they want to do. And usually that's going to be lower budget films that are self-produced and self-financed. And here's the problem. Let me tell you how unfair it is. You go out there with your, you know, $250,000 movie or whatever, you know, that you've scraped together to do and you've done it and you've done a really good job and you go out there. And then you wind up being on this, you know, you, know, it, you get it on Amazon, Okay, you get it maybe into uh, Tubi or you get it into, uh, you know, some of these little outlets and then um, you go sell foreign territories at Cannes or AFM and, and you know, you, they, they give you 5,000 for this territory, you know, 5,000 for this territory, you know, uh, other territories, you, you, know, you bundle five or six movies indiscriminately and then throw it at a distributor in South America. Okay, and so, you know, it, it, and you get nothing. Um, so what ends up happening is that the, the producers, the way it's set up now, you can't really recoup. Um, and that if you're doing a, a low budget, no name movie, and if you do a movie that has, uh, you, you know, names in it, then of course that compromises it too. Unless that actor, you know him personally, and he's got the same vision or she that you do, uh, then there's that influence. And then, um, then there's the other influence of getting your director approved. And then there's the influence of getting the writer approved. And then maybe this guy should come in and do some rewrites. And it's, it's, it, it's a, it's a murky territory with, with OPM. And then, and like I say, with your own though, they go, who's in it? Oh, it's one of those. Okay. Throw it in the pile. And so the filmmakers go away. They may be very talented. They may be like, you know, the best and the brightest, but they're told to go away and there's no money for their, backers and they feel like failures and then they go oh and i'm not going to do this again and you have okay so what's the attitude you have to develop to, to deal with that you have to go into it with the idea that it's a, a crapshoot and that you're not going to allow yourself to become discouraged 
from what the marketplace does. But the marketplace, you know, back then in those days, we had VHS, you know, Blockbuster. We had you know, you know show to all these you know cable outlets. Yeah, I was uh, going to say you can make money from multiple different easy. avenues. Yes. Yeah. Now, I uh, you know the only way that I can see to make if if that's the bottom line making money, then you have to have somebody in it. If you have somebody in it, then you know uh, it's 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 a real uh, pressure squeeze. There is another angle though. If you make it for really cheap, really cheap. Like some of these guys right now, like I'm looking at this clown thing, the terrifier and how they've done and some of these other guys, it, you, but you do this really on purpose, you know, uh, cheap and, and, you know, you, you, you get a, something you really like and you go ask three people in a house or whatever. And then, you know, if shutter buys it or whatever, and they give you, you know, and then if, uh, you know, I think in this one, IFC was doing a theatrical. And uh, so if you get that, then you can make, you know, a little money on your, you know, it's still going to be cheap. And if you do it for a really low amount of money, that means no post. And if you don't do post and you don't have the right composer and things like that, I mean, you know, I don't know. My attitude is is to go higher and higher. I I just, uh, I think that it's, uh, I I just think that's what we should do that, you know, with our company crazed house, we just need to uh, keep pushing for the next level. And, um, you know, work with people that, you know, that share our vision and to do that. And here's my commitment. I will write the shit out of it so that they will love it. I'll do the extra, I'll do all the extra work. I'll make sure that when they read it, it's going to be on a par better than the scripts they're getting from the, you know, the sent to them. And, and if you can do that and they can fall in love with, I think it all starts with the script and if they can fall in love with the script, I think that's, that's going to erase a lot of sins. You know. So what one thing I wanted to ask about before we close out um, is I wanted to ask about uh, how Crazed House came together. And I also wanted to give you time to talk about Girl Next, which is the feature that you and um, Larry have worked on. Uh, and I thought it was a very good movie. I thought it was a very enjoyable genre feature. Uh, it, it's, it's very dark, um, off-putting in some ways. I think there's some elements of dark humor to it, uh, but it deals with everything from Nazi mind control to you know, uh, like trauma-based mind control. And I just Uh-oh, wanted you to delve into uh, how the idea for Girl Next came about. Okay. Well, we talked a lot about society. I feel like I need to, I, I want to also get the crazed house and stuff and all that in there. What happened is, well, it's kind of coming out of a dark place. I mean, should I go into this, Trish? Or what do you think? Yeah. So I had a tragedy in the family. And uh, see, I was retired from all this. And, um, you know, and it's, uh, and I was really depressed, you know, (laughs) all my writing and everything I do comes out of like trauma and pain and suffering. And so a really bad thing happened and I was uh, almost not functioning. I just, you know, and then Trish, my wife and partner in Crazed Out, she uh, pushed me to, um, to do another film. And so she contacted Mike Muscal online, you know, and Mike and I go way, way back. And, uh, you know, he's an award-winning producer in his own right. And, you know, and, and so here's, uh, I can't answer that. How can I turn this down? Um, so he, uh, so he and I started talking about, uh, you know, doing a movie and he, and he had these rules, you know, Oh, five guys in a house, that's it, you know? And um, so he was already starting to, you know, in with that, that attitude, which you need that. But I'm, you know, we always fight over things like that. And um, we had one idea um, and it was too expensive. And I wrote the script up and it was something we're going to do, but we couldn't do. So I saw this movie where there's a couple, I think it was a Swedish movie. You might know better than me. And they went out uh, into the country to their uncle's place. And uh, they were going to try to, you know, patch up their relationship and have a vacation and all that. But it was a weird remote place in the middle of nowhere. And there was a psycho living in the main house. You know, I mean, real simple. And they didn't know it. And they moved into the guest house across the pond. 
and uh, looked like it was kind of a you know maybe a F- Finland or maybe been I don't know Sweden and I'm not sure it was like a co-production with American actors and and, uh, and then this guy you know it started getting worse and worse and more and more dangerous and um, you know the guy was you know you start off seeing the guy is cutting up some you know human into you know chunks of meat and and you know and he's really nuts. And they're trying to work on their relationship and they don't know it. And so you get that suspense element. I told Mike about it and I said, well, this movie, it just really kept my interest. I was really riveted to this thing. It was really simple. And I, I mean, I was into it. I mean, it was, it was pretty scary. So we started working on a couple of ideas like that with the psycho living there and everything. Somehow it, it evolved into a thing about human trafficking because I have been an activist against human trafficking. And of course now, now I've, you know, I feel like a failure with all the human trafficking. I would feel we haven't even made a dent in it, but I was an activist with that. And um, especially freeing children from uh, brothels, from, you know, pimps and, and brothels. And, you know, so they, you know, cause this is, this is a big problem in our, in our world. Now. So uh, we had that element and then, I had done a track, a, a song with Kelly Rowley called Simulacra. And what it's about is about, well, you'd have to listen to see what's this. It's like, like a little movie, sonic movie. It's really, to me, it's about reprogramming. It's about trauma-based mind control. And uh, so, and then Mike insisted that that simulacra aspect, that had to be in there. So that would be Lorian's journey. And, and, uh, and then we found out more about Larry and as Larry and I went, you know, and Larry agreed uh, with me, he didn't pull any punches. He was going to, you know, we, we, we did, a, you know, we found the right Larry and we found the right people. We found the right Heinrich. And we just really combed the earth to find these people and uh, had some, well, long and the short of it is, you know, it, it started becoming a, um, not so much about Heinrich making this new Sophia doll because he was making sex dolls. That would be, you know, basically his secret was to reprogram so they wouldn't be un- ever unprogrammed. So he would, he'd be the best programmer. And then they, you know, the black limo picks them up and takes them to the airport and they fly off to, to become dolls and, you know, in a, in a harem, some rich guy's doll, somebody to abuse, whatever. And all that's based on reality, unfortunately. <laughs> And, but Lorian, you know, she's not like the others. Um, and, you know, certainly she wasn't, but you see the entire thing was an experiment about Aqua Velva. It wasn't about continuing the programming. It was, yeah, I was going to ask, what was, what is Aqua Velva? Uh, this drug that, uh, he takes. The Aqua Velva is also called quantamine and it's a, it's a, it's a substance that's not of this world. And it, and it allows people, you know, I mean, they're not sure exactly how it should be applied or whatever. I mean, Heinrich had his own way of going about it, but it, it opens portals into other dimensions and other worlds. And, and they were experimenting on Heinrich because they, you know, Heinrich wanted to take it himself and he wanted to, uh, you know, become that like Superman, like a God, you know, that he could go between these worlds. And then he started talking to the dead and he started realizing that there was another world there. And he, he thought that they picked him to, to do this new work. He thought that new Sophia Lauren was going to be like a, a political figure. Like maybe she would be somebody they could put in the government and then they could control her. You know, that was not in the film exactly. And they will be in the, in the release of the Blu-ray, but I mean, um, so this was going to be the new Sophia and he was using a combination of, uh, trauma-based mind control, like you've seen in Clockwork Orange, but he was also using drugs, you know, insane mixes of drugs that had, you know, things like steroids and, you know, uh, DMT and uh, all kinds of things to, you know, to expand a person's mind so they couldn't fight back. And then after, and then through the trauma, you know, they would, um, the whole idea was to cause the person to dissociate and to lose their personality completely. And then to to put back in another person, but instead of that, what happened is that Lorraine was programmed to be, you know, have this done to her, and then she comes into her purpose. Hard to explain, but she she becomes unprogrammed, 
Okay. Unpacked. And she's a, you know, a, she's a, an assassin. She's a CIA. She's military. So, you know, and uh, eventually I think Misha says, well, that was the whole point. We're an experiment here. They're watching everything we do, every little thing. And what they're really doing is, is, is testing the aqua velva, getting the data off the aqua velva and what's happening with Heinrich. And then they, then Lorian's in there uh, to clean it up. And so here's the thing is you just, you're getting a you know, glimpse of all that, but we're not explaining it. And, and, but the, but you know, there's a quantum devil, which is actually featuring Heinrich's father. I was going to ask about the element of, of the quantum, you know, because there's uh, there's that scene where Heinrich says to uh, Lorian, you know, this is going to be your quantum moments. So that seems to, yeah. this idea of the quantum really figures into it. Maybe you could explain that. Yeah. Well, you know, so Heinrich's convinced that Lorian doesn't know there are other worlds, but you know, there are other worlds. Okay. So, so she's, she's being pushed into, he goes, Lorian, this is your quantum moment, which is, um, you know, he'd already said to her before it all got, you know, with the guns and everybody shooting everybody. It before that, he goes, it doesn't work on you, does it? After you know, when he's trying to make love to her, just before you know, she strips her slip off and they're having sex and they're going to or whatever. He goes, it doesn't work on you, does it? And uh, Misha's been confused by this whole thing, but um, what he means by that is, here's your quantum moment. Here's your chance to. Uh, you know, you, you know, expand uh, into the, you know, the quantum thing. And, and, but she's not going to, to do that. So, um, you know, she eventually meets the clown head, this giant clown head. Then she takes a couple of rounds to her shoulder after he says, this is your quantum moment. Then he keeps doing the aqua valva. He keeps just jamming in his face. His face is falling off. He's glowing blue from the inside. And his job right now is to, to hunt Lorian down and kill her because she's the problem. And, um, and his, the, his sister, Charlotte, is saying she's already broken through, meaning she's already integrated. She's already whole. She, we were duped. She wasn't who we thought she was. She's the wrong girl. And uh, now she's turning the tables, and, and, and he's like, nonsense. They chose me. I'm the way forward. I'm the way to the, to the next world. I, the, when, I, when I have this breakthrough, this will be the breakthrough of the, of the ages, you know, and, and he's falling apart. And um, so it's, it's, it's very, interesting because he's very, Heinrich is very, I think, hubristic. He has a lot of arrogance. Uh, yes. He thinks that he's the one in control, but I don't think he is. Uh, you know, I, I love the line that Charlotte has where, you know, she says uh, they're tracking us and she keeps referring to Legion. Um, you know, the, the, the demons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, there's Legion, but uh, they are tracking and it's really, they're being tracked by the government and or governments and, or, you know, uh, MK ultra people or whatever, but uh, it's the whole thing's an experiment. And um, you know, that really what, when Larry and I discovered that, because we, we were actually just editing along and, you know, we're going to make it so that when she gets to that shooting range and now she's going to teach women how not to get abducted in the parking lots. And that's not Lorian. We, you know, actually, you know, then then she we see her saying that she's a clone of a clone. Then she says she's a program clone. She's in the room with all the mannequins and she sees herself dead. She sees she pulls off one mask and it's her dead. So there's so now we have a whole bunch of questions going around this Lorian. Well, Misha and Heinrich are trying to work out their sick relationship. And and uh, Charlotte is really the one running the show. And uh, but she's being defeated by Lorian. So he's she's telling Heinrich to go, you know, that, that we need Lorian dead. And um, she tried to be friends with her. And the whole thing winds up in a big mess and a big bloody shootout. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, it and Lorian. Um, well, I didn't, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, you should see it because we <laughs> we really, you know, like it, but we're going to be adding to it. And, you know, like I say, the novelization that, that just was done will give you a lot of answers as to, you know, like who was Lorian before this? What are Lorian's memories? Where did she come from? Where does she live? Who is this Jeff Blake guy? 
Were those really her parents? Did she really go to a, a Texas A&M game? Is she really, you know, and, uh, and, you know, the more you look into this, the more you come up with a blank. You don't know who the fuck she is. I, I was going to say that's a very interesting aspect of the film for me. Because you get tidbits about her life, but you don't know what's real and what's not. She's she'll say like, "Oh, my parents were racist. And I thought they were, but they aren't." And she, she'll she says a lot of things about her past, but we really yeah. don't know who she is at the end. Yeah. Well, not only that, after doing the novelization, I don't know who she is, and I did. My, I, I I went. I plumbed. The, I went into every aspect, and even some of her her you know her handlers and. You know, the people, you know, supposedly programming her and where she went and how she got debriefed. And, you know, I mean, picture after the show is over, she's walking out of there and she's walking up to the uh, the road and then picture a bunch of SUVs pulling up, you know, and putting her in the SUV. And so that that's really what you're dealing with. We, you know, we have we're tight budget constraints. There are things we couldn't do because of budget. And so and then there's other things we did to conceal uh, well, we never gave away Lorian. You see her floating as an angel. And I'm, we're going to get to the bottom of it eventually. But, you know, it, it's um, this is a big pursuit of ours to find out who Lorian West is. And, you know, we may even do a comic book series on it, you know, just to follow her around. Because even after we did the movie, we got to the movie to the part where she was training the women on the shooting range. Like, this is me now. I'm training these women to not be abducted in parking lots and how to shoot. And yet that's not her. That that's not, it, it's really more her with the, the, yeah, she says, I know, I know now I know everything now. And then the clown starts laughing at her, <laughs> you know? And it's like, and so, so it refutes really. She doesn't, she really doesn't know uh what she's talking about but she's she's functioning in a way that's very very high level functioning so it's it's a very interesting thing i'm i'm very excited to to you know because after we have a a, a new a new one now where she she's she's in this briefly it's called uh, never ever after which will be a, a new feature that we're we're going to do you know it's more with um you know with more traditional with you know known actors and such and and uh and, um, you know, never, ever after it almost sounds like a James Bond type of theme. I, um, I was going to say, are, are these movies all connected in the sense of, I have not seen quantum devil yet, uh, but I understand that that's, uh, the, the movie that comes after girl next, are these movies all connected? Are you creating sort of a, a universe yeah. here? It's a quantum quartet and it, it ends with dragon Island. Now dragon Island is we start getting some information about this quantum and about life extension tech. And, and there really is a dragon, you know, and but the dragon's hallucinatory. And so if you see a dragon with a tail that's, you know, 10 miles long, 20 miles long, five miles long, you don't know. But then all of a sudden comes this beautiful woman and uh, the most beautiful woman in the world, the most seductive, beautiful woman ever. And and they're you know, trying to seduce these people into, you know, that side of things. At the same time, the island has these properties like it moves, it disappears. And the guy running it, uh, you know, and uh, the, the people that are involved in it, um, you know, they're kind of tribal. Living on the island, they're surfers. They ride big waves and they're, they're really kind of wicked. But the clientele they have there, they have like an inner level to the island where it's like infinite space. And some of these levels deal with, um, you know, with, with, with sciences not of this world like you could you could make yourself another person you could become a 20 year old you could um so they come in a wheelchair and they leave you know as a goddess or something and um you know using this technology there's also other creatures that you end up meeting we have in the quantum devil you get your first glimpse of what what are called the seal men they're these they're like seals but they're really scientists and so you start getting a glimpse of that. And then in Never Ever After, they they you can see they have, they're kind of like aliens in the sense they can, no matter how damaged you are, they can put you back together. But when they don't touch you, they float above you. And they have, they're like a kind of a humanoid shape with a seal head. And um, so, you know, where it's going, at least in the next phase is um, that Heinrich's father 
is was capable of, of creating an entire world that people live in that's now gone apocalyptic and it's going to end. And if he can do that much, if they can do all that, that, that the world's a simulation, the whole thing is a simulation, but you start seeing how they're doing it by using this, this, uh, this substance and they, how they can tie people's minds together to create uh, another world to live in. And then when that ends, it's like, well, where's the real world? Is there a real world? And so there's, so that's, it, it kind of gets into a lot of avenues. And then of course there's, you know, following Lorraine around, which will be probably developing her as some sort of heroic um, figure, you know, that um, I guess what Lorraine has to do is make a decision, you know, that she doesn't want to be programmed anymore. She doesn't know if she's a clone or not. She'd like to settle down and have a boyfriend and stuff, but things keep she, her life. She thinks it's one thing, then it becomes another. Then she's reprogrammed. Then she doesn't. She's on assignment, and she would like to defeat the the people that are you know putting her on assignment. So, girl next is uh, basically Lorian is sent in there, and you see the result. But Heinrich's not done. Heinrich's not done. He his his chest got blown out the back back wall. And you can actually see the back wall through the chest. Very proud of that effect. And uh, but but he and he, when he's on his knees, he goes, "This is just the beginning." You see, Heinrich exists in that other world now. He's broken through. So even though his sister cuts his head off, and he's bleeding blue, glowing blue, um, he uh, he's still he's still in some ways alive. So, you know, it's... it sounds like what you're going for is almost a, a story that's um, maybe going to bend people's perception of reality um, or make them question what is reality. Well, they should, because this is not reality. OK, I, 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 I know that you tell people to take your word for it and this and that. I mean, you know, I've been, you know, I became, you know, with all the kind of things I've been through and I, you know, I. Yeah, you know, don't ask people. You don't have to. You can be my friend and not believe what I believe. Okay, so the first thing I'll say, because a lot of uh, Christians have rejected me, but for my views, you know, I'm I'm basically persona non grata because I talk about this being a simulation and I prove it. I can prove it. You know, I, I can prove it biblically. But see that, that you run in and you know the stereotype of the you know of, of you know, Christians and you know the the kind of uh, you know, intolerance and all that that people associate with Christians. I've experienced a lot of that, um, that, that, you know, the churches in America to me are corrupt and they tend to want to um, silence people from this, any kind of thinking. And, um, you know, and if you do have thoughts and you do have imaginings, like I'm an imaginative, imaginative person, um, then it's like, you know, Oh, you better stop that. you you, you, you might have a demon, you know, and uh, suddenly you're, you know, might, well, maybe you should burn me at the stake then, you know? And, and so, you know, I do have my, uh, you know, and I'm sure with Girl Next Time, I'm sure I lost a lot of uh, people with that. <laughs> but I'm like a lot of people on a quest, you know, and got back into filmmaking. I don't, I don't intend to like, just, I don't know if I'll direct again because that's, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm a director. I'm, I, I'm working that out, but I, you know, I, I am a writer and, and I am a, uh, I like to present, I like to, I like to put the thing together and <clears throat> see if we can keep it going. By the way, the premiere of Quantum Devil will be at, at uh, Frightmare in Dallas. Oh, really? May. Okay. And, yeah. So that'll be the premiere. And then after that, uh, you know, theatrical release, limited theatrical. And then after that, uh, it'll be available at all the usual outlets. So we're going to wait till May, end of May, May 26th, I believe. And then, and then we're going to screen it there for the first time worldwide. Then it'll be out. So there was a delay. We could have had it out earlier, like this year, but I wanted to go. I think we made the decision that it'd be a lot better to have that thing come out with a big crowd there. And last year we screened Girl Next and everyone really loved it. And there's famous people there that loved it. And Julian Sands gave us a great review of it live publicly he sees he went on and on about it so i was like wow i love this texas frightmare i gotta get back i'm telling you all the fans 
kind of people that you you like to talk to and that, that are interested in your show, they're all there. It's wall to wall. And these are this, these are these are the real fans. These are the the, the the people that really love society. They really loved, uh, you know, whatever's going on. And you'll see people that are like, you know, you'll see uh, Lance Heinrichsen was there last year, and you see, uh, um, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, you know, they're they're trying to get Brian there this year. I don't know if, they, if Brian has to get on the phone with the guy that's running it, but it's so big that they couldn't. The Hyatt Hotel at the at the Dallas airport couldn't handle it anymore. So now they've rented the, uh, um, uh, it's north of Dallas, this convention center. So we have to stay in hotels around the convention center to be able to accommodate how many people. I mean, there's just walled, I've never seen so many people really. Like It's like being at the most exciting football game of the year or something, or concert. And um, no, it's more than that, but it's a lot more than, you know, you, and there's no room in the halls. Uh, you know, there's no room anywhere, but all the favorites are there. And uh, John Carpenter will be there this year. And he may be playing They Live. That may be live. You can get you can get him to sign stuff if you like memorabilia, you know. And who was there last year? We had, um, um, uh, you know, it, it, it just depends, but these guys show well, it's, up. It's one of the biggest horror movie conventions. You got Texas Frightmare Weekend, so... That's exciting that you're going to show Quantum Devil there. Yeah, and the crowd's really, you know what I mean? They're going to be with you, and they appreciate that you, you're making the effort to, you know, to give them something new. And you feel that love, you know, and that's, uh, you, you know, that, and that's, that's worth everything. I mean, you know, you want to you get your stuff to the people that would like it, you know, and not try to fight through the whole public to find those fans, you know what I mean? They're, they're all just built in. And um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, Robert England uh, was also did the, the character in, uh, in um, our Barack. Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he's in our film. I mean, he's doing a, an animated character. Oh, really? Yeah. That's exciting. Freddy Krueger yeah. himself. Wow. Freddy Krueger. He'll be there. He's a really nice guy. And um, he was there last year signing uh, stuff. He won't be there this year in person, but he'll be there. His voice will be there in our character, Barada, who's a, a giant, you know, 500 foot demon. And he can change size, though. but it's uh, Robert England's voice. And it really it really adds a great because, uh, you know, it's his voice. You know what I mean? It's got that that presence. And um, so that's it's, you know, it's a. Uh, but again, it's like everything we do at Crazed House. It's, it's going to be different. So yeah. the, the element of, um, real quick, the element of, um, I guess, this this idea of spiritual warfare it yeah. is going to be uh, explored more in the film. Because I really, I like the way you uh, deal with like this idea of the spiritual world and, and other worlds in, in the movie. Um, and I don't think, I, I think anyone, regardless of their beliefs, can get into it. Well, we are all, regardless of our beliefs, subject to all kinds of shit from other worlds and, and you know, curses and demons and, uh, you know, people say, oh, there's nothing to that. Uh, don't go over there. That place is cursed. And ah, I don't believe that shit. Next thing you know, the guy dies. You know, So it's, it's um, you know, we're, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, we, this is this world that we're in. We only see a very limited amount of it. But um, we haven't know. pierced the veil, so to speak. Well, that's what quantumine is. That's what aqua velva is. It's to pierce the veil. But then the bad guys want to use it to be God. And to make everybody, you, you know, I just feel like that's what we're in now. I mean, how could we have it so that the whole world is being told, you know, uh, we're going to we're going to take out the world. We're going to lower the population. We're going to control you so all your constitutions and independence declaration of independence and all your magna cartas and all your stuff it doesn't matter it's we're going to run it now the the rich the really rich and i'm talking the trillionaires now they're going to tell all the countries what to do and what are the countries going to do they're going to obey so now we're in a real fight and let's see what people do i i i hope you know that i've been struggling with this left versus right thing for a long time, and I I realize now it's all silly. They they're trying to just pit us against each other. I think what we should do is realize there is an oppressor, 
and it may not be of this world. And th this world is rigged. Like I said, it's a simulation. And But we need to look a little bit beyond just our normal thinking, because I do believe it's a supernatural aspect that's holding, you know, people back. And we intend to do movies about it, you know, and, and uh, in this one, the quantum, the, the Dragon Island, so interesting because the military industrial complex, those guys, they want the island for themselves. And check this out. So you end up, you know, and the dragon is Satan, right? The dragon is like the same, you know, it's the, it's the, uh, the dragon from, uh, for the ancient Babylonian dragon that um, one of the sons of the dragon was actually Marduk, who became Satan, uh, who is the first king of Babylon. Okay, so we have that history. Here's the thing. You actually end up having sympathy for the dragon and hating the military industrial complex. So now, but the dragon's not going to do anything for you because the dragon, you know, wants to take you out. But I'd rather be, you know, take my chances with the dragon rather than the military industrial complex, if I had to take one out in a fight. So now we're gonna see a big fight between the two of them. And uh, I don't know how much we can get away with because you know, I can't say a lot of stuff on the air too, because you know, it's, uh, don't wanna bring, you could say something in fun, being funny and then you know, next thing you know, someone takes it the wrong way. So uh, anyway, uh, Craig's House was born out of, um, we did Girl Next and we, you know, Larry and I were really had a vision. We just couldn't stop there, I guess. And we just felt that we had, uh, you know, with the time of COVID and all this stuff falling apart, it was like, well, let's see if we can do something else. So we've done three now. We did that, Quantum Devil, and the documentary called The Dark Side of Society, which is not cleared yet completely. But if, you know, if and when it does, there'll be a, a movie about how, with me in it, you know, and uh, about how, you know, I, I came to write that uh, screenplay in the first place, what happened leading up to that point and how the screenplay itself, the writing of it was um, and, and working with, you know, the whole thing about the movies is it was therapeutic for me. It was a, it was a way of, you know, because I was <clears throat> I couldn't I, I just don't think I could function in this world. You know, I. I uh, probably would have wound up in an institution just permanently. And so the writing kind of, you know, sort of saved me in a way. And then, uh, and then Brian came, I said, Brian doesn't realize this, but you know, no matter what, and who wants to take credit for what, I don't really even care. You know, give, give it all to Brian, give it all to, you know, fine. But the point is, is I'll always be, you know, in, you know, we we'll always love Brian and the whole thing of how that all came together. It just was like showing me that, you know, it, we weren't just all going down the tubes and it was therapy for me. It, it bought me another, you know, 10 years to figure out stuff. And um, I did end up leaving. You wanted to ask me about dementia too. And that was a, uh, that was a nightmare. <laughs> that was a nightmare. Well, you know, um, dementia was, um, I really did like the screenplay, but I do believe it was a uh, kind of in genre terms. It was a tweener a little bit. It's like a drama that becomes a thriller in the end. And um, it, it was met with kind of mixed reviews. But what happened is I was going through a divorce at the time and the ex was chasing me around and we got, you know, Trish and I were together and we were having to kind of live in different places. <laughs> so what I did with it is I had a cut and I gave it to a distributor and, and, you know, they recut it, not exactly what I might've done, but they, they recut it. And then it went out, um, you know, I saw it in Hollywood, you know, blockbuster and Hollywood movies and Showtime and it, it, it did the rounds. Um, it was met with like mixed reviews, I would say, but there, there are people that really like it. They really love it. This is like everything in America. I, I don't really fit in America because there's a lot of sex going on in there. And whenever you have sex, it seems that the American audiences, they, they don't like it, really. They, 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 they tend to, you know, the, 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 they, they, I don't know, maybe it triggers them. Or I'm not sure what it is about it. But the Europeans are just way more, you know, they get what you're trying to do. Right, here, right. There's kind of a block that goes up, especially... Like I, this one, you know, one critic got, got on me for us 
I guess I'm responsible, but you know, for having a transgender person in, in uh, um, uh, Girl Next, and then you know, being accused of you, you know misappropriation, um, because it was a, it was a, an actress playing the part of a transgender, not an actor playing the part of the transgender. We made that to, so we looked and looked and looked for the right actor at first. It was supposed to go to an Asian uh, uh, guy at first. And then, you know, we, we had to settle on the best actor. We just, she was just the best. She beat everybody, you know? And so why not give her the opportunity? And um, she played it perfectly. I mean, she played it perfectly. But I was going to say, it's a very interesting character too, because uh, oh, you end up feeling bad for her in some ways. She's an abuse victim herself. Absolutely. We love her. We just, we... It's just tragic. It's it's your heart, uh, you know, goes out, and you know she's like one of these, you know, people that you know she is what she is. She came out of the punk rock scene in Europe, and she was like, you know, and Heinrich and, and them, they're a couple, but you know, there's that the young girls they're programming, and and you know, and there's jealousy, and you know, and then she feels uncomfortable with her gender decision because she's still hung up about it. Like, you know, I'm, don't think I'm not as good as, as you just because of that, you know? And, and so there's that kind of thing going on. And I know that makes people uncomfortable here because everyone wants everything in a box. You know, like here are your pronouns. Here's your thing. Here's your thing. And, and have this box. But what if it's in, in, in this movie, it's very fluid. I mean, these, you get all the things they're going through and it, you know, it doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense, but you know, there's, um, you know, what I try to point out to people, I said, well, did, did they ever really, you know, call her, uh, call her out on, on being, a, you know, uh, a woman? No. Did they always refer to her as Misha? Yeah. Did they always refer to her as a woman? Yes. And then, and then the, the secret comes out later. I have no problem with it, but I mean, there are people that have, they, it's like they want you to go through these hoops and get permission to do it the right way. And um, so they, you know, mainly Generation Z, probably more than anyone else. But this one guy took me to task. He just had a list of every mistake, just a whole laundry list of everything we did wrong. And I'm, I was so fascinated that a guy would take that much time to slam us that I was kind of, and then they called me and Larry misogynists. And <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, I just say, look, we just make the movie the best we can let the chips fall where they may. Not trying to be disrespectful to anybody. We're just trying to, you know, get our vision down before the money runs out, you know? I just wanted to ask one more thing, and I hope it's okay to ask this. Um, are, are there people that have worked with you when you're working in film that they don't see eye to eye in the sense of, I know you, you've you talked about your experiences with yeah. uh, Satanists and, and cults and whatnot. Yeah. Are there some people that say, okay, I don't believe any of that? Are, are you still able to work with people even when they question those experiences? Well, Rick didn't believe any of it. <laughs> Brian, I don't know what he thinks. I don't think he believes in my version. And I love them and we get along great. Um, um, you know, Larry and I are kind of, you know, he's a younger version. He's younger. You know, he's, uh, you know, he and I seem to get along pretty well with, but then we're both, you know, uh, but I know how it is to be, you know, the sort of, you know, be you know, doing films when it's the culture is trying to push for, you know, to get rid of white males and especially born again Christians and all that. And I'm saying, yeah, but, but we're, your stereotype of us is not correct. You know, and the other thing is um, the whole crew we had in uh, Girl Next was um, was was pretty much in opposition <laughs> with uh, us. And I I felt I got along fine with them, too. I, you know, I it may not have been this. I mean, there was some pranks here and there, like they would put six, six, six on the slate, you know, and make, you know, funny trying to. you know. But see, I've been through it you'd have to be me to understand where I'm coming from. I'm not, you know, someone that you could sum up in a cookie cutter thing and go, okay, it, it, the, the things happen that led me to be you know, the person I am through life. And, and also it's not over yet. I'm, I'm very willing to listen to anybody about anything. 
but I just tend to, you know, I tend to have my, it's funny when you, when you, you know, um, when you have your own views and you have, you know, the truth you're seeking, if you have, um, I just have to believe that if I align with truth, whatever my truth is, that, and I align with God, my God, my truth, whatever, and I'm doing that this God is happy with me, then I feel like I have protection, you know, because there's a lot of things we enter into. And there has been spiritual warfare that has been almost, you know, I won't even go into it, but there's there's been opposition here and there. And um, it can be life-threatening. I'll just put it that way. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there that's not on the news, you know? And um, so we're trying to cut through and, you know, get to the next film and, um, you know, trying to speak our piece. But here's what I think. If I am honest with my truth, just like bare naked, and just here I am, this is it. I think we're going to get universal acceptance on some level, even if we don't agree eye to eye on details or whatever. You know, for example, okay, the world's a simulation, you know, and I, I do believe that, and I have, I have a lot of ideas about it. Now, a lot of people don't believe in that, and they may reject me because of it. But there are other people that do believe in that. They may not believe what I believe, but, but we may have some common ground in that area, you know, in quantum physics. So anyway, I guess what it comes down to is do you want to be a, a people pleaser? Well, we certainly do want people to be entertained by the movies we're doing. But I mean, are you going to be a people pleaser? Or are you going to go for truth? Are you going to go, or do you want to be really popular and have everyone like you? So, I mean, that's the decision in the in the arts, too. Because you can do stuff to make people like you. you know, I, and I can tell you a million story ideas that they'll love you. They'll just love, love, love you. But is it you? Are you supposed to be doing that? Who are you? Are you somebody? Do you have, you know, do you have a point of view? And, and, and if you do, wouldn't it be better to go with that, even if they throw rocks at you? Well, you don't want to get in purpose go out and have them throw rocks at you, but you, 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 you've, I just believe if you, if you're honest with people, people will give you a fair shake. That's what I think. You know, anyway, that's, <laughs> that may be naive and, and I'm, you know, but I've carried it on for a long time. Uh, we did, there was another movie that didn't quite make it out there called Angel's Tide. And um, I think we sold one pro, one territory to Brazil and it had, this was me also directing. And it's kind of, you know, I guess there's a failure on my part to get it out there. But uh, this one did have some famous, it had Larry Lindell in it, who was in MASH, you know, that famous series. And it had, uh, it had some other people in it. And uh, my wife was in it. And, and, and it's, it, it was about a, a drama about a woman who was dying that was trying to make up with her father. And it's, it's really good, you know, but it, I don't know what happened there. Um, it, you know, maybe I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if we're, you know, I went and got it digitized in 4k because Larry was saying, our director was saying, you should, you should definitely not get you that, you, you know, cause you watch it. He was crying his eyes out. He said, this should be out there. I'm saying, Larry, it's, I mean, we're now going back. I don't even know how many years. I don't know that they would like it. Maybe we could shoot a wrap around and, you know, and, uh, you really think it would be worth people seeing it? And he goes, yeah. So, you know, so that's it. And and, and that's the future. Uh, I also have a couple of books out. One very insane called uh, Glass Backwards. And the other one is Lamb, which is my Christian novel, which got rejected by the Christians. <laughs> and uh, shouldn't have. Because it's very... Why did it get rejected out of curiosity? I think as I was, there was, I think it's, it was, maybe Trish will agree with me. There was a scene where there was like uh, two women in a pool, um, you know, kissing each other or something. And I think that they couldn't handle that. <laughs> so, so that, and, you know, I got, it was one of the best agencies in the world for a Christian books. And I was trying to, I had Jerry Jenkins, you know, the left behind guy to give me a referral. I, I never felt good about it in the first place. I mean, I, I, I you know, there's a big novel to called Lamb, but it got, it was like, uh, you know, you know, so now 
Then after that, I was so angry, I wrote Glass Backwards. I see. And that's the potty mouth of the century. It's about a, um, a mind control guy controlled by the CIA <laughs> who's an assassin. And um, his name is Vincent Damien Del Monte. And he, uh, he's used by the studios, by the big studios, to kill people that are in operation. You know what I mean? To get rid of people. Um, but he has a problem with his mother. And so the first thing you see is he goes and kills her, but he's completely psychotic and he's got all these little friends that he thinks are there and they're not. And sometimes they're not. And, um, I think they're very afraid of that. Uh, I know Larry read it. He wanted to do something with it and bring it to the screen. I do believe it would be a good movie, but it would be, it's completely, you know, it, it deals with that, that world of, uh, it also deals with Satan, Satanism, but Satan actually shows up in the book and talks to the reader, says, look, reader, and talks to you directly and tells you not to believe this character, what he's telling you about the world, about anything. I'm, I'm also, I'm trying not to keep you overly long. We've talked for two hours almost, but okay. I, I, I just wanted to come back to one thing. Um, you said that you think people have misunderstandings about um, someone being born again or white mill. Uh, I mm -hmm. just wanted you to elaborate on that because- uh, I don't get the feeling that you have like, um, I mean, because I've listened to your show before, uh, actually, when I was growing up, and I, I don't get the feeling you've ever had like, um, like racialist views. You're not like a Richard Spencer or anything. So I, I do think people misinterpret some Christians on that. Well, I don't have, you know, I don't know. I mean, I have a, a prayer group with people from all over the world. So we got our African, yeah, we got our Sri Lankan, we got me, we got uh, Trish, who else we have there? We've got that that goes once so huh? Oh, the Pakistani, yeah, we we are involved in it with a Pakistani uh, group that to, to free children from the brothels there. And uh, so it's very international. And all the people we work with in film, it's all, you know, we do our post-production in Barcelona, so that's Spain, and then we do our uh, music in London, and then we have... Uh, the, the guy that did that great uh, shotgun shot. I just love him for that. He's uh, uh, from Greece, from Athens. You know what I mean? So we have, you know, I, I, I didn't have, uh, you know, I didn't have the reg regular high school experience or anything like that. I was kind of institutionalized. I'm sorry to put it that way and be vague, but I mean, there'll be more coming out on that later. It was just a terrible time. And, uh, but one thing that happened with all this uh, torture um, and attempted mind control and all this other stuff they were doing to me. One thing that came out of it was uh, you don't get the luxury of being, um, you know, a racist. You know, <laughs> because it wasn't in the curriculum. You know, so if you don't learn, if someone doesn't teach you to be racist, I guess you don't become one. I, I don't know. But people have been racist toward me uh, until they get to know me. Do you know what I mean? And so I, 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 I so like, like here we live in, um, it's, it's, you know, we're a, white is a minority here and we have, we, we were very happy here, you know? So I, I don't know. Um, you, you mean in Santa Fe? Well, in Santa Fe and we're in the County, we're out in the country here, but I mean, you know, in this area of New Mexico, we have, we have all kinds of things going on. We got the uh, indigenous people that were, completely ripped off by the government. We have the, uh, we've got a very, it's very much a blue state. We have um, mainly Hispanic um, leadership and both business and government. And, um, and it's home, you know, it's, it's, I, I just can't get it. They, but very few times people make an issue out of, out of, you know, the skin thing. I, I think in uh, Maui, I went through that when I went to a surf spot, I wasn't even going to surf. I just went out there and the guy was calling me a Holly and he was getting, he was really getting, you know, he was getting on my case. And I just, and I said something to him and he just, we just connected and that was the end of it. And uh, it was cool, you know? So I don't, I hate, I hate the, 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 the whole, I, I the, the you know what it is? It's that we, as humans, we're just all imperfect. And I think, you know, that we, we, we just, we're looking for a vector of hate. 
Yeah, and I, I think too, I think in a weird way, you know, uh, our oppressors uh, use racism against us. You know, it, it's well, a divide and know, conquer. Yeah, I mean, if you have... I understand. Uh, and that's, and that's true. I, I think we're all going to come together at some point because the oppressor is going to become, you know, if you want to go that with that theory, the oppressor will become very, it'll become very easy to see. It'll be the people that it, it's, it's the trillionaire class. I'm telling you. And they uh, believe they're running the world. And so, and if they take away everything from everybody else, we're all going to be in the same boat. <laughs> you know? And so uh, there you go. But, 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 uh, yeah, I was really a radical. I was a communist and I went to these meetings and mainly in the meetings, this was back in the eighties, you know, this is back during the society time, uh, where like a lot of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the people in the meetings were like waiters, waitresses, uh, maids, you know, uh, just people that are doing the work, you know, the, the work and they're not, you know, they're, they're not happy. We were stuffing envelopes and this and that. And I remember I was a member of this party. What was the name of that? It was like the, the Green Party or some kind of thing. And when I went to vote, you, you know, it was like, and I lived in a, like a Democrat precinct. They're all Democrats, okay? When I went to vote, they freaked out. They called me a pariah. They went nuts. You talk about the Dem- – you'd think it would be Republicans that would be like that. It was all the Democrats. They were just on my case. They said, you shouldn't even be allowed in here to vote. You know, and and I and I said, well, because what, 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 we thought, you know, you're you're going to vote for this person, and it was this black woman. I and I'm sorry if I forget the name, but it was all happening back then. It was the green, the green peace, the peace party of green or something like that back then. And basically, the whole thing was a, um, you know, a grassroots movement, and main, the main people that were members of it were just mainly working people. That um, and then you'd see them at the meetings. You know, you'd see like if you went to the restaurant to have some fries or something, and then you you know say, "Hey, I saw, saw you earlier today. Let's stuff some envelopes." But, uh, it never got violent or anything. It was just um, you know. Now I hope that the people that are being manipulated into being violent, feeling like they're going to get their utopian world, I hope they understand that the people that actually are paying for it all have no plans to include them, but maybe they'll find out down the road. Well, hey, Seth Daniel, I want to thank you again for coming on Parallax Views. How can my listeners keep up with the work you're doing in film and also uh, the Zeph Report? Well, the Zeph Report is uh, a good way. If you want to get mad at somebody, you can listen to that. Um, but yeah, that's just my thing. That goes out three or four days a week. And it's pretty much everywhere. And then I have uh, an assistant of mine that um, that helps me, and she she will like put out aspects, of, like fifteen minutes here, fifteen minutes there of the, the the best part of those. And they they're kind of extemporaneous, and that they uh, that that I just talk until I'm done talking, and I only talk when I feel like I'm being moved by God to talk. And so there's that. Then on film, I'm on IMDb. Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, as Zephy Daniel, um, so that's easy. Uh, suppose I have a, a you know Facebook. I haven't been there though in a long, long time. I have to get back there to start trying to you know promote our stuff though. I have to you know put some ads up and things. I've you know Instagram too. I've got a membership there, but I have not been there. But I need to get there more. Books. Um, well, what you want is the new book of. Here's what here's here's would be the ultimate thing. If you pick up the book, girl next. In fact, I'm going to send you one. I'm going to send you when as soon as the book is done, the book for girl next, and then you have the movie. And each one will make you want to like. If you read the book and you haven't seen the movie, you're going to want to see the movie. And if you have the movie, and you haven't read the book, you'll want to read the book. So that that'll be out on Amazon and stuff. And then if you're into the Silent Night, Deadly Night thing. Uh, Lionsgate's got a new pressing, a new Blu-ray coming out, and they interviewed me. Oh, and really? That's exciting. So I'm I'm on camera, and the guy said he really liked it. Uh, uh, he he, he uh, th- who was the producer. So I don't know what I said, but it's going to be fun, and um, it's fun to go back and remember those those more innocent days we've had. Um, so there's that, and then music. Uh, well, SoundCloud now is mainly, I, I replay the Zeph reports, 
but because I've been the last song that I actually produced was at the end of Quantum Devil. It's called Ether, and it has a great singer named Katie Brooks on it, and uh, it's got Colin Mc McGinnis, our composer, that added a whole bunch of layers to it, and uh, Luke McPeak in London, who also did a mix, and then I mastered it back here. So, but I don't have that. That you can hear that on the Zephyr Report, but it's not. It's published yet. We have to work on publishing everything. And uh, Brian, um, Brian is out there and, um, you know, I haven't, I've been working over here. I've, I have been unable to find out where we're at with that novel, but we did do a bunch of drafts on the society novel, the novelization, not sure how we're going to get that. Uh, there was a guy that wanted to publish it. He's got, you know, a, a publisher. And um, so I'm not sure what we're going to do there, but uh, Brian wants to, you know, wrap that up and have, uh, signing uh, book signing with it, so I can tell you one thing. I, I really think it's entertaining. The book, if you, the book is going to make you want to read the movie, uh, see the movie. And if you see my interview about writing society, that's we, that's almost ready. That will make, in my opinion, that's also you know makes Brian look great because Brian's there, you know what I mean. And we having a reunion, and it's all love. And um, but it also makes it it makes you want to go back and watch that. So. That's my spiel. And I'm sorry I went overboard. How, how long did you want me to be here? An hour? No, I, I, I'm actually, I was okay with going overboard. I, I actually, uh, since you mentioned the IMDb, I just wanted to briefly ask you, I saw that you had a a, a special thank you, apparently, uh, for the movie Ed Gein that Chuck Barello did. Uh, that's yeah. listed on IMDb. How did that come about? <laughs> that's Mike. Producer Mike. Oh, oh okay, okay. I Yeah, my I was buddy. wondering, because I, that's a very underrated, uh, strange movie. <laughs> Yeah, no, Chuck Perello. I mean, I was there. Mike was practically living in my house when he did that one. I remember he was shooting up in Topanga and um, he had Chuck Perello, uh, you know, and he got the great, amazing Steve Rails back. And, you know, I was in love with that actor. I, I just, I don't, did you ever see The Stunt Man? Did you yes. ever see? Yeah, yeah. Can you believe how great he was in that? Oh, he's uh -oh. incredible. I mean, he's incredible yeah. in everything he's been. And I remember, I think the first one I saw with him was the movie where he plays Charles Manson, the Helter Skelter movie. Oh, he was playing this Manson. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I've been a big Steve Rellsback fan, but but from the very beginning, you know, from, from the stuntman days. And, um, you know, so Mike got Steve Rellsback. I was like, oh, my God. You know, and then... That film, Ed Gein, won uh, Sieges. So, you know, it's a win, 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 win. And he was up against Brian. He beat Brian. Brian had, I think, I'm not sure. He might have had Night of the Living Dead 3. He might have had something. I'm not sure what he had there. But uh, so, the, the you know, these two guys that made a lot of movies together, they were competing. And uh, then and Mike pulled it up. Mike eked it out. Ed Gein won. And uh, it, I got a special thanks for... Um, I helped with the edit um, with notes. I, I gave him, that's all I did. I gave him notes, you know, just what I would do. They were having trouble with the cut and I was trying to be helpful. But uh, yeah, that was back in the nineties. And uh, he did three films back then that he did with, he had one with me though, called The Innkeeper's Daughter, which we never did. We never produced. Not only that, Mike is also, credited with um, uh, Quantum Devil. He had the original screenplay called Devil's Domain. And it's interesting how that came about, that he gave me that if I wanted to direct it back before we had Larry going with, with uh, our company. And, um, you know, I, I was, you know, not 100% sure on that, but I remembered the script very well. And then, you know, we optioned it from Mike or we, we, you know, got the rights from Mike on that and then added some other things. And Larry did the rewrite, the, the writing on that. And uh, Mike, uh, not only Mike, but um, his writer that he used back then, Stephen Johnston, also is, has a reanimator credit. He, he wrote one of the reanimators. So he's also involved in the, if you will, the uh, the background of Quantum Devil. He's, he's uh, so we have... Mike and Steve, and then me and Mike, and then me and Larry, and, and then eventually the movie. So, yeah, Mike, uh, 
the Ed Gein thing, yeah, that I, I you know, I really didn't know it was going to do that well. See, you never know. And it really did well. It was really, uh, he was flying high. He had a new shiny car and he was, he was the mogul for a while back in the nineties and, uh, and well-deserved. So yeah, we've had a lot of, you know, that's how I got back into film. We started talking, well, Trish called Mike and said, you got to rescue my husband. He's, you know, going down the tubes here. And so then Mike and I started talking and then, you know, thank God we made a movie. I mean, sheesh, I, I don't know what I would have done had I not done it. You know, the, the tragedy I went through is my daughter died. So it was the, uh, I couldn't recover from that. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing, it seems like you're doing great now uh, with these movies coming out. I suggest everyone see uh, Girl Next. And thank you again, Zeph E. Daniel. Thank you very much. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Zeph E. Daniel. And that you'll check out the movies we talked about, including Society and his latest film, Girl Next. As always, if you appreciate the work here I do at Parallax Views, please, please, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. One more time, that's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And with that being said... Until next time, you've been listening...